Finding faith, well it has felt a bit like a journey as we come to our last session together. Uh, really for, for me as I uh, do this series, as I say it's the second time I've had the opportunity to do the series, it does feel like personally I'm going on this journey and uh, building blocks around faith. Uh, and so it is in a way like finding faith and it's appropriate that as we come to the end of our series, as we come to the end of our consideration and we reflect on all that we've, we've talked about, that it all should bring us to find faith, and that is to find it in perfection, to find it in the perfect example that we have of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So perhaps we can just spend a moment to think about where we've come from. We started at the beginning of this week talking about faith as a Bible term trying to understand that this concept of faith is something more than perhaps we might have started thinking that it's just to do with trust, that it's just to do with believing, that when we look at the Bible understanding of the Word, that it is those things and so much more. We saw that there was this connection through the word faith, the Greek word pistis and the Hebrew word aman, between something which is stable, something which is solid, something which is immovable. And we saw that that place of the immovable, that place of substance and foundation and constancy is only found in the realm of the unseen. And so we saw that when we looked at the definition of faith in Hebrews 11, really what Paul is calling us to, the writer to the Hebrews is calling us to, is to develop a mindset that is in keeping with the realm of God, outside of our reality, in the realm of the unseen. This is the place where we find the conviction that cannot be moved. We then saw how faith saved, how that it was through faith that Abraham obtained righteousness. And we then started to look at the faith of Abraham. And we noted very early on that this faith was a special faith. It was believing in something that was impossible. And we saw this theme of that which is impossible, that which is irrational, that which makes no sense in the natural world is one of the very definitions of faith. We saw that Abraham's faith was ultimately in resurrection because resurrection from a real world perspective is the ultimate impossibility. We then looked at how faith isn't just calling us to compliance. That through faith we're not just being called to be sinless but rather we're being called to perfection. This amazing term, be ye perfect, even as my Father which is in heaven is perfect. And we see how over and over again the Word of God is calling us to perfection. And, and that when they, they, they saw this in the example of the rich young man, the, man, the disciples said, then who can be saved? And Jesus brings us back to faith. For by faith the things which are not possible are made possible. We were then driven in our journey for faith to that place that you cannot escape from. That place where God purifies and increases our faith. And it's been, in many ways, from the talks that I've heard from Brother Kitson and uh, from what I've heard also from what Brother Ted has been saying, that when we come to know God, when we come to connect with God, He comes to work on us. And it is in the process of trials and testing that He works primarily, first, on our faith. To purify it, to make it more, to increase it so that ultimately we might have faith that is like gold. And we talked about the qualities of that kind of faith, that, that, that quality of a faith that can be so malleable and can be so ductile that it connects for, for as far as we are, we are still connected to the Father and yet is so incorruptible. And then we looked yesterday at the way in which the fathers of faith The fathers of faith gave us the example of what their faith was, their conviction, and how their conviction was in the resurrection. How over and over again we saw examples of men and women who displayed their faith, not through the traditional works we might have expected to see, but through the things that they did that showed that they believed that no matter what, God would bring them from death to life. What a wonderful example of true faith. So in all this, we've been driven now to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of a, a discussion I had some time ago with, with some Trinitarian friends. And we were uh, uh, busy doing the, the normal debate, which often doesn't get you anywhere, but um, as a bye. 
Um, we were discussing pre-existence. And uh, I remember I was trying to show them the, the usual passages that suggest that Jesus didn't pre-exist. And they were showing me the usual ones that suggest that he did pre-exist. And I was trying to show them how their passages were being taken too literally. And so the discussion went on. And eventually, in the process, I suddenly thought of something which, you know, you get those, they're very seldom. You get the odd brainwave. Well, something came through. And I said to myself, you know what? Jesus couldn't have literally pre-existed because if he had pre-existed, he couldn't have had faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If Jesus Christ had pre-existed with God, he must have seen God, and the whole concept of him hoping if he was outside of time in some form makes no sense in reality. So I said, there, you see, how can he be a man of faith? Well, my Trinitarian friend just turned around to me and said, well, he's not. Jesus is never described as being a man of faith. Well, at the time I thought, well, yeah, well, and I went away that night and I took out my Strong's Concordance. In those days we had to take out, you know the old physical one? Did you? Some of you still got those? The physical book? Heavy things, good for exercise. Anyway, <laughs> paging through, looking for faith in Jesus Christ. It was difficult because you had to look up faith and then go, all the passages. And I tell you what, I was battling. I was battling. Yes, there are many passages that spoke of the faith of Christ, but I knew that their versions would say faith in Christ, and that wouldn't be that helpful. And, and almost in desperation, I said, I've got to go back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is the chapter of faith. If Jesus had faith, he's in Hebrews 11. So I went through and I read Hebrews 11 again, carefully, reading every single verse, saying, where have I missed it? He's got to be a man of faith. And of course, you'll know what happened. For once, I decided not to stop at the end of the chapter, like sometimes we're encouraged to do by the Bible Companion. And I carried on reading. And I bring you now to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. After this record of the fathers of faith, all of these amazing examples of faith, what does the writer say? Therefore, same chapter really, same, same comment, there, there shouldn't have been a chapter break. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all of these men and women who have gone before, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And then if you look carefully in your King James Version, you'll notice one of the worst words being inserted, which is not there in the original, the word our. The author and perfecter of faith. And it all makes sense. Of course he's in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is all these examples of men and women who in some way displayed faith and they are the cloud of witnesses and they point towards the greatest example of faith, the author and perfecter of faith. The Lord Jesus Christ. I had my verse. Of course, I went back quickly to show them. This discussion didn't get much more successful when we enter the debate. We don't often win. But the point was amazing. I found in that very place that Jesus Christ is indeed the greatest example we have of faith. Of course, there are some of the verses that I've discovered since then that, that do show us that Jesus was a wonderful example of faith. Revelation 1 verse 5 is a great verse. Revelation 1 verse 5 says this, And from Jesus Christ, when he's talking, giving his introduction towards the letters, and from, uh, towards the, letter, uh, the book of Revelation, that it should come from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. And of course that word faithful is the same word, just a slight variant of the word pistio, the word faith. Who is the, the full and perfect example of faith, the witness to us of faith. In this man, Jesus Christ. Again, in Revelation 3, verse 14. These things says the Amen. Oh, yes. Now we can see why the word Amen is used there. These words says the Aman. It's a Hebrew word. The faithful. Oh, there's the Greek, Pistio. Ever had them so close together. And true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. And again, Jesus is described as being the perfect example of faith. So it's fitting, isn't it? That as we come here this morning and... In our final session, and many have said to me, on a number of occasions, many have said to me, 
Are you going to start talking more, at least in some practical detail, of how we can focus on our faith? Of how we can increase our faith? If our focus is not going to be on our works, and we need to increase our faith. And we've talked about how God can increase our faith through suffering, and how we can respond to that in the correct way. Are there other ways? Because I'm sure we'd like to find those, rather than suffering, that we can increase our faith. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at Jesus. If he's the perfecter of faith, let's look a bit at his life and see what he did and perhaps learn from the way in which he increased his faith. And then I want to spend the last part of this talk by letting Jesus tell us from his own lips what represents great faith and how we increase faith. So that's what we're going to cover in in the time that lies ahead. So I want to start off by thinking about Jesus for a while. Look at these two verses. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Luke 2 verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. A couple of points to note there. First of all, hopefully through our discussions, you're starting to see, when we started, I said... I, you know, I'm going to give you some ideas and definitions of what I think faith means, but what the Word of God does is it creates associations for you. So hopefully now as you leave here, and whenever you read the word faith, certain associations are being created for you. You're going to think that when I read the word faith, perhaps I'm going to find the word impossible nearby. And I'm going to find the word perfect nearby. And I'm going to find the word suffered nearby. We, we, we start to see all of these ideas are all to do with faith. They're, they're all linked together. And, and, and it's interesting, it's telling us in those two passages that Jesus in some way increased. You know, the word increased, in fact, in the, in the Greek actually means to drive forward, to grow, to improve. Have you ever thought of that for a moment? Jesus improving. I mean, you, 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 you start off sinless, don't you? In terms of sinlessness, you can only go backwards. We, we, we talk about Jesus Christ as being sinless, and that was a huge achievement, but, but in a sense, that's not improvement. You can't increase in sinlessness, if you understand what I'm saying. What was Jesus increasing in? What did Jesus have to grow in? This is, this is really something for us to, to mark and, and, and think about. He increased in wisdom, it said, and stature, and in favor with God and man. You know that word favor is, is, is the root word for the word grace, comes from the Greek word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. Get the word charity, obviously, from that. But you know, in Strong's Concordance, one of the definitions it gives for this is the divine influence upon the heart. The divine influence upon the heart. Well, th- that, that I think, from all that we've learned about faith, would be a wonderful description of faith. The reality of God in our heart. And it's saying to us that in some way, Jesus is increasing in the divine influence of God on his heart. The the, the Hebrews passage is telling us that the way this was happening is through suffering. And what we've seen in Peter and James is that suffering is working on our faith. I believe if there was a way in which Jesus was increasing, it was in his faith. The reality of God became more and more in the life of Jesus. So that if we look at his life, we see almost a a, a, a model for perfect increasing of faith. Something that we can say, well, because if Jesus was made perfect in faith in the beginning, we might say, well, we we, we can't learn from that example. We've been told to increase in faith. But now if we can understand that that was a process Jesus was going through, then, then, then his whole life is something that we want to model so that we could increase our faith as well. So what were the aspects of Jesus' life that helped him to increase in faith? Well, here's the first point. We've talked about faith being a foundation. Faith is that first thing. Over and over again we said, first faith. Faith has to be the foundation of all that we do, all that we develop. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that in the life of Jesus, when we look at his life, the first thing we notice is that faith is put in place right at the beginning. Now, of course, he wouldn't have had much choice in that. This is the work of his father. His father knows that he needs to increase in faith. And so right at the beginning, we see that Jesus' first block or building block of faith is the influence of his parents 
on his life. So I want to put that down, perhaps, as the first of the ways in which we can increase faith. Not our own faith, in this example, but as parents in this room, the foundations of faith you're establishing for your children are the most important that you can ever give. And think of of, of so many of the great men and women of faith who obtained a good report. Moses, Samuel. Think of the influence, especially their mothers, had on their faith. And so we read this. And the angel came to Mary and said to her, Hail, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Wow. Mary, selected from all the, the multitudes of Jewish women at the time. And God must have gone through woman after woman and says, Who can be the mother of my child? That she might instill faith in him and, and nurture that faith. And of course, we, 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 we don't know that much about Mary, but what we know is when she hears this message of Gabriel, she breaks out into a song that is so spiritual that many of us have spent hours upon hours coming to grips with the wonder of her words. And they were on her lips. So God looked at this woman and said, here is a, a lady with a spiritual mind. Here is a woman of faith. And my child needs to increase in faith. And the best thing I can do is to start with the influence of his parents. And of course, it wasn't just the influence of his mother, but obviously also the influence of his father. His father in heaven. His father to to whose house he went to as soon as he was able to, to learn from his way. And then when we look at the development years of Jesus, of course we're not told too much about those years, but we are told this. In Luke chapter 2, you know the words well, Luke 2, Jesus is, is lost, they can't find him, they go looking for him. And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought for you anxiously. And Jesus said, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I would be about my father's business? So here's the second, perhaps, uh, a model or idea we get from the life of Jesus. First of all, it was the influence of his mother, his parents. Secondly, from a young age, he went to places where faith is to be found. You see, as as, as much as we would perhaps like it sometimes when when our brothers and sisters are frustrating us, it's very difficult to find faith on a lost island. Or to go up onto a high mountain by yourself. It's not impossible. We can connect with God. But an element of finding faith is to find it in the place where faith is. A Bible school. Your ecclesia. Where, where people are taught. And, and you think about it from Jesus' perspective. As much as he knew there was hypocrisy and legalism in that temple. How often did he go there? Did he just go there all the time so that it was a a, a platform for preaching? Or did he go there because he knew what it represented? It was a place where faith was. And of course at the age of 12 he said to his mother, didn't you expect me to be here? Didn't you know that that if I was going to go anywhere it was to a place where faith is to be found? Wonderful example for us. That if we want to increase our faith, we need to go to the places where faith is to be found. And then as Jesus became an adult, we see other aspects of his life. The next is this. Right in the beginning of the ministry, the Gospel of Mark, it introduces us to Jesus. And this is one of the first things we read about Jesus. And we're focusing on Jesus. How did he increase his faith? And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place. And there he prayed. Luke 6 says this, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer. How do you increase your faith? Faith is the reality of God in your heart. And you don't communicate with him? And your prayers are ritualistic? And your communication is one way? Think about it for a moment. How does a man or a woman spend a night in prayer? Well, he only does that if he's truly communicating. Now, I don't want to get into this debate, but I'm one of those that believes that God didn't, on a regular basis, talk verbally back to Jesus. 
I think Jesus often understood what God was saying through the Spirit and through his remembering of the Word of God in, in, in various places in the Old Testament. We see this when we see him speaking, how he always is going back to the Old Testament to understand what his Father wanted. I think sometimes we think that Jesus would go up into the mountain and just be having a, a literal conversation with God. Perhaps it was that he just learnt the skill of being able to have that kind of conversation even when there isn't a literal answer happening. This is the kind of intense prayer that brings about the reality of God in our life. In John 12, in John 12, we do have this idea in Jesus coming out. But on this occasion, God does speak. Here's Jesus praying in John chapter 12. You'll remember again these words, verse 27. Look at the way he prays. We, we get a few opportunities to get into the kind of prayer that Jesus prays. John 17 is a great example. John 12 is another one. Jesus' prayer is not ritualistic. He puts his feelings in the presence of God. You can't pray ritually when you lay out your heart before God. L listen to this. Now my heart is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. Can you hear the conversation? There's a conversation. He's working through it with his father. Father, save me from this hour. No. It was for this reason. I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. It's a prayer. This time a voice comes from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. How can we increase our faith? Prayer. There was an occasion when the disciples came to Jesus and they said to him, I'm not sure if I've got it up yet. We'll come back to that. They said to him, why is it that we couldn't heal this, 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 this child that, that, that had uh, demons? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief, for most certainly I tell you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind doesn't go out except by prayer and fasting. So Jesus immediately links for us the fact that, that faith, how do we get faith? You don't have enough faith, he said. Well, the way you're going to get it is through prayer and fasting. So there's a very clear answer from Jesus. The intensity, the value of our prayers, the, 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 the spirituality of your prayers, the, 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 the personality in a way, how personal are your prayers, is going to be a measure of your faith, is what I'm reading from what Jesus is telling us. And he says fasting as well. We'll come back to that in a moment. Fasting. Fasting is one of the ways we can increase faith. I wonder how that helps us with our faith. Perhaps we can come back to that. A bit later. And what I did miss out is Romans 10 verse 17. We haven't referred to this passage. We often quote it, but again, how did the Lord Jesus Christ gain in that communication with his Father? Prayer is one form of communication. Of course, listening to the Father is the other. Romans says in 10 verse 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We communicate with God both by our prayer and as we know, by our reading. And so as we read, we are, if we do it in the correct manner, filled more with the thinking of God because the word of God contains the thinking of God so we're seeing from these ideas the way in which Jesus in his life increased his faith and I put some of the other ideas up there not all of them we've gone through but he went to places of faith uh, he was influenced by his, his mother he focused on God's word he remembered the past on a number of occasions when people came to him he would quote the past he, he, he would ask them to remember what happened with Abraham and, and various other examples. He was focused in prayer. And of course, uh, Hebrews 12 says, he constantly focused on the joy that was set before him. So, if you're coming to me and you're saying, how do we increase faith? Here's the perfect example for you. The author and finisher of faith and perfecter of faith. Here he is. That's what he did. How much time do we spend doing those kind of things? Or are we just busy in the routine activity of the things of the truth? In the time that remains, I want us to come closer to Jesus. And I want us to listen to him as he answers a question that I would have wanted to answer. You know how amazing it is sometimes in the Bible? You've got a question 
and, 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 and you've been thinking about it for a while, then suddenly you discover he was asked by somebody. And you get very excited. You know that the, the famous one is. People say, well, what, what is God's glory? Well, there it is. Moses says, show me your glory. Thanks, Moses. Great. You've, you've asked the question and we get the answer. There was a time when the disciples came to Jesus and they said, increase our faith. Wow. I mean, that has got to be one of the questions. Faith brings perfection. How do we get faith? How do we increase our faith? I wonder how many of you sitting in this room right now know what Jesus' answer was. To perhaps one of the most important questions he was ever asked. What did Jesus say? I mean, I want to know. Some people have said, well, you know, the question that they asked was the wrong question. Faith is not something that can be measured in quantities. I think that's incorrect. But Jesus, on a number of occasions, we're going to see this, talks about great faith and little faith. The concept of faith increasing and growing is a biblical concept. And, 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 and that's not really a quantity issue. It's really a quality issue. We've been talking about purification. And that's what they were asking for. We, we, we want more faith. So let's go and have a look at where they asked this question. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And, and it's amazing to see the context. The, the previous example where Jesus said to them, you don't have enough faith, uh, was an example where they couldn't heal somebody. And they said, you know, we, we need a bit more faith so that we can do this healing. This example is a bit different. And, and, and you're going to smile when you see the context, because this is the context. Can, can we have one of the lights on? I'm just half blind here. That's great. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to the person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into a sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. Interesting. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. It's in the context of our brothers and sisters. And he's saying, you know what? All these rogues out there, they can, they can do seven things wrong to you. And every time they come and say, forgive you, you forgive them. Hey, and these disciples say, Whew, we need more faith. If that's what's asked of us, increase our faith to be able to do that. To be able to care for the little ones. To be able to honestly reach out to those whom in every way we think don't deserve forgiveness. Increase our faith is the question. And I guess one of the reasons why we don't know the answer is because Jesus, as usual, doesn't give the kind of answer we would like. The kind of answer I would like is the checklist. Oh, increase our faith. Yes, like the one I gave you earlier. Well, this is how you do it. You can uh, 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 say more prayers, you can fast more, you can read God's Bible, and you can go to meeting. Ah, great. Now I've got the four. Tick, tick, tick. Thank you, God. Thank you, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've worked out how to increase our faith. He doesn't do it like that, does he? Hardly ever does. He tells two stories. This is the answer to the question. Mustard seed, unworthy slave. Sure must have got them thinking. Mustard seed, unworthy slave. Luke chapter 17. We need more faith. What does Jesus say? He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing and looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant, when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did that which he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say we are unworthy, unprofitable servants. We have done only our duty. A mustard seed and an unworthy slave. Now we could spend ages on those parables, but I want to just take out what I think is the essence of what Jesus was saying. Jesus referred on an early occasion to the mustard seed, didn't he? He referred to it in another parable, and we've spoken about this parable before. In fact, it's in Matthew chapter 13. If you've got a moment, you might want to just go there, Matthew 13, where Jesus refers, and I think if we're trying to understand Jesus' parables, we need to use the Spirit to interpret the Spirit. 
Matthew 13, verse 31. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in the field, though it is the least of all the seeds. Yet when it grows, it is the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Now, the obvious ideas we get from these two parables is the idea of growth. That something which is small and starts off small can have huge results. They came to him and they said, increase our faith. Perhaps what he was saying to them is, yes, even if you've got a little bit of faith, it will eventually increase and, be, and, and do huge things. And, and the idea is that, that perhaps by going back to Matthew 13, that this is related to the kingdom of God. And that your faith, as we've been saying, should be focused on the kingdom of God. And all of those ideas are correct. But there is something that strikes me in Jesus' answer that harmonizes with the second parable. He chooses and says, if your faith is as a mustard seed, which is the least of all the seeds. Least. The word least means insignificant. It's in fact similar to the word little ones we've just seen above. It is, it is the, 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 the insignificant thing, the, the mustard seed, the most insignificant of seeds. Is he perhaps describing an attitude of the heart where faith can find root? You see, they wanted lots of this faith. Can, can you see what, it, what, what happens when you, you think you have lots of faith? Can you see where it's bringing you? It can bring you just the same place where works brings you. I've got lots of faith. I got lots of faith. You, you don't need lots of faith. You need faith as the least of all the seeds, mustard seed. And then he tells them the parable of the unprofitable servant. He, here's a chap who's, who's done all of this work. He seems like a great servant to have. I mean, he does everything. And when he comes home, he's worked the whole day. He doesn't sit down and say, well, now, you know, now it's my turn. I've, I've done my works. Now, now it's my turn for my reward. He, 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 he feeds and, and, and gives drink to, to, to his master. And even when he's done that, he doesn't put up his feet and say, I've, 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 I've done it. He says, I'm still not worthy of what I have. He, he never considers himself as if it is any due of his to receive a reward. He reminds me of the, of the slave of Exodus 21. Remember the slave? He, he, seventh year, go free. He looks at all the gifts he's received from his master, his wife, the house, everything. He says, No way. I, I'm not going free, my, my seven years, my day may be up, but, but, but put my ear through the door, open my ear, because, because I am nothing without you. I mean, you can send me away, I'll leave my wife behind, my house, you've given me everything. I am nothing without you. I am an unprofitable servant. Now, brothers and sisters, I believe Jesus is teaching us in this parable, you want to increase your faith. The secret is in humility. A man will only, and a woman, learn to develop faith when they learn to empty themselves. You know, John says a, a, a phrase that we all know from Sunday school that it was only probably a month or two ago that when I read it again, it struck me as one of the greatest principles of the doctrine of humility and faith. I'd never seen it like this. When, when John stood up and he said, he must increase and I must decrease. Well, we, we understand it in the context. Yes, of course, John, you were preparing the way. And now you were not going to be the central figure in Israel. You were going to decrease and Jesus was going to become the center of Israel. But what about that for a principle of life? He must increase and I must decrease. What about that for a principle of measuring all your behavior? When you find yourself in a situation in the ecclesia and those brothers that have offended you are there and you're about to react and you want to know what to measure it against, he must increase and I must decrease. In those words is found, I believe, the, 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 the secret, if you will call it, for a man who will increase in faith. For a man who will increase in the reality of God in his life. And of course, this is consistent with so many other messages. And it's consistent with the Lord Jesus Christ. Come with me to Philippians chapter 2, if you will. Philippians 2, look at this. 
Because if this principle is true, then we will surely find it in the example of Jesus Christ. Verse 1. Philippians 2. If there is therefore any exhortation in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies and compassion, make my joy full by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. I love this passage. But I've also been so disappointed by its use. This is the very same passage, and we'll know it, this one mind passage that's been used to cause such division in our brotherhood that's been used to cause such sadness, that's been used to go against, I believe, what we've just read concerning how many times in Luke 17 should I forgive my brother. And we get it all wrong. What is the one mind that Christ had that we're all to have? What was the secret of what Christ had that enabled him to increase in faith? Well, read on. I don't have to give you the answer. Doing nothing through rivalry or through conceit, but in humility, each counting others better than themselves. Each of you not looking to his own things, but each of you also to the things of other. Have this in your mind, this mind of Christ, which was in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but listen to the words of John, but emptied himself. Taking the form of Jesus, of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the death, yes, the death of the cross. Wow. Jesus Christ spent his life emptying himself and filling it with the Father. So that he could say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I have emptied myself and filled myself with the Father. And the only way you can do that, brother, the only way you can do that, sister, is to have the mind of Christ. And that's the one mind that should join every one of us. The spirit of humility. To this man will I look. To him who is of a contrite heart, a contrite spirit, and who trembleth at my word. This is the place where faith can dwell. When small gives rise to great, fate begins with the least. The place of the unprofitable slave, he must increase. And we must decrease. So let's see whether in fact this is consistent with Jesus' assessment. Only brothers and sisters, we're going to close with this. On two occasions, in the whole of the ministry of Christ, is it recorded that Jesus said to a man... And a woman, how beautiful is that? A man and a woman, you have great faith. What an assessment. You have great faith. And you know that these two partner parables have one thing that is in common. Let's go and quickly look at them. It's in Matthew 8, verse 5, is the first of the parables, of the, of the examples, the miracles. Matthew 8, verse 5. What do you think is great faith, Jesus? What, what, what allows a man or a woman to increase his faith so that it becomes great? Chapter 8, verse 5 of Matthew. Jesus entered into Capernaum, and there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy. He's grievously tormented. Jesus says to him, I will come and heal him. Now, the way I read that parable, that could have been the end of it. Here is a man who comes, he calls for Jesus, Jesus says, I'll come and heal him. Done deal. And if it had ended there, we would have learned nothing about the real faith of this man, but it isn't finished. The man says to Jesus, Lord, I am not worthy. Oh, seen that before. Lord, I am not worthy. That's the same as we got from the parable that you gave in answer to how to increase your faith. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man also under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to this another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, it wasn't up until he heard that confession. He marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. Wow. And what was it about the centurion amongst all the other things that we know we can get from this story? But what is clear? Here's a man of humility. Here's a man who, although he was in authority, he had servants, he, he, he 
realise that the authority that Jesus was under, just like he was under the authority, that's why he says, I am also not a man in authority, but rather a man under authority. I'm under the authority of the Roman Empire, and that's why I can tell a servant to go there or there. He realised that when he was with Jesus, that Jesus was under the authority of God Almighty. And in comparison, Caesar was nothing. I'm not worthy that you should come into my house. I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. And then Matthew 15. Matthew 15, just a few pages on. Both in the Gospel of Matthew, partner parables. Matthew 15. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously waxed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. This is different. This isn't an easy one like the one before when the centurion came and said, look, can you heal my servant? Jesus says, yes, I'm coming. This woman is going to be pulled a bit. But you see, most of us, imagine when we say our prayers and we ask God, please help us, and then we don't get an answer, or sometimes the answer is negative. We're quick to give up. Not this woman. Not this woman. She isn't quick to give up. The disciples even said, send her away. She's making a noise. Verse 24. He answered and said, I'm not sent but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, that, you know, hearing a message like that from the Lord Jesus Christ would have put most of us away. But you know, she's a woman of humility, isn't she? She's not thinking about herself. What does she say? She came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. He said, it's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. He's pushing her. He, he, he's got her numbers. And she said, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith. A man, a woman, both Gentiles, both of them came for someone else. Philippians says, when we were reading about the mind that was in Christ, caring more for the needs of others, Both of them came for someone else and both of them showed humility. Yea, Lord, the dogs. I'm a dog. I'm a Jewish dog. I'm a Gentile dog. And I'll just take the crumbs. The very least. Just the least. That's who I am. I'm worth just the least. Humility. This, my dear brothers and sisters, is, I believe, the real essence or the real beginning of faith. We haven't got time to look at fasting, but but if you have time, you can go to Isaiah 58 yourself, and you will see in Isaiah 58 and Ezra 8 verse 21 that fasting is all about humility. That's why when Jesus at one point noticed the fasting of the of, of, of the Jewish uh, Pharisees of the time, which was all about, hey, look at me, I'm fasting, I've got sackcloth and ashes, you can see it a mile away. He said, you've missed the whole point. Fasting is the denial of yourself so that in decreasing yourself you might increase God. The principle of humility. And so again, we understand why Jesus said that fasting was so important. So finally, my dear brothers and sisters, by God's grace in looking at Jesus, we have seen this perfection of faith. This man who stands before us every Sunday morning and as often as we come to him, and shows us how to increase our faith. The head of, of the list of Hebrews 11, found in Hebrews chapter 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works to follow them. We started by saying, without faith, It is impossible to please God. I want to draw your attention just to one last passage that we all know well, but I'm hoping that through this series now, when we read the word faith, it'll have a whole bunch more meaning than just a doctrine. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians is a chapter, chapter 3 rather, that we go to so often, Galatians 3, as a, a chapter on baptism, a chapter on the promises, A chapter that sometimes, because we see as a first principle chapter, it doesn't enter into our heart the way that it should. And here in Galatians chapter 3, faith comes up on a number of occasions. 
But I draw your attention just to one verse. So those who have faith, faith, think of all that that word means. Think of how you find it. Think of where it comes from. Think of where it, how it gets increased. Think of that unassailable conviction. Think of how God works on it. Think of all the work that's going into that word when, when the writer says, if you have it, you'll be blessed along with faithful Abraham. Faithful Abraham. To be full of faith. What an amazing hope that is. And if we are, we will stand together with all of those we read about and talked about yesterday and with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will hear the words he heard. And the Lord said, This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased because he and because she is faithful. Amen.